Hey, hello friends. Thank you for joining me again today. My name's Dan, and uh, this is Daily Art Adventure number 905, and my little clapper is broken. <laughs> Here's the broken off part, just to prove it. <laughs> Gotta order another one of those. <laughs> Daily Art Adventure, anyway, number 905. And I'm doing, as you may see there, another pen and ink and watercolor sketch. So let me go ahead and move you guys so you're looking straight down at my work surface. And you don't have to look at me much at all. There we go. So here is... Uh, my sketch so far and I skipped a couple steps um, here's the photograph this is a commission for of all things Richard or Rich Santora a high school buddy <laughs> Rich I hope you get to watch this later I'm not sure Rich even remembers who I was <laughs> It doesn't matter. <laughs> he was one of the cool kids, and I was not. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Hi, Rich. Hope you're watching. I appreciate I appreciate the opportunity to work for you. I really do. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen me do this process before, let me explain it a little bit. I start out by doing a sketch several times with watercolor pencils always progressing from a light color like yellow to a dark color like red and blue in this case and then sometimes I'll do pen and ink which this is a fountain pen filled with waterproof paint or finer lines with a sharpie you know felt tip marker with also waterproof um, but on this particular painting just I'm in a mood to experiment like I often as I often am and uh, I've done two things after the watercolor pencil I did a little bit of masking fluid. Now, not much, partly because it turns out I'm running out of masking fluid, so there wasn't a lot of it to be done. But, um, and then the other thing that's a little different from the norm is I didn't, oh, getting a little bit of static, hang on just a second, there we go, okay, it's funny how it starts out clean and then develops noise late in the process, that is very strange. The other thing I'm doing slightly differently than, than I often do is uh, I didn't do any pen and ink on this one, I went straight from the watercolor pencils to watercolor. My hope is that in doing that I'll just I'll be I'll get a little bit more uh, free-flowing chaotic color. Most most people would think wait you want chaos and the, the answer is yeah pretty much <laughs> don't you? <laughs> the better watercolorists among us, and I'm not putting myself in that category. That's why I, that's part of the reason why I do these watercolor sketches instead of, very often, instead of like a traditional watercolor painting because I can get away with more unconventional tricks, in my opinion. I can get away with more tricks if I uh, call it a sketch. you're seeing 
up here a lot. Right now it's working very well. Uh, of what I like about uh, doing the watercolor pencils. And that is that I get, when I apply water, or watercolor paint in this case, when I apply watercolor paint to the paper, the, the watercolor pencil explodes in a, a multiple colors because I because I put multiple colors of pencil in this case uh, basic not multiple in this case simply uh, yellow red and blue I know this is in Italy somewhere, but that's essentially all I know. Rich, I should have asked Rich where it is, but this is uh, one of his trips to Italy. Which, let me tell you Rich's name again. <laughs> then, then it'll make sense. Rich Santora, okay? <laughs> you know, one of those nice Irish fellas. <laughs> no, um, my goodness. Um, let me preface anything I might say by saying uh, I had a delightful in many in in many ways one might even even say an idyllic high school experience even though it was in two high schools and the reason that rich i don't know if he knows me he he knows who i am because he you know we met on the high school alumnus uh, uh, facebook page right so that's how he got to me I don't know if he remembers me from high school, but and the reason is because I was only there for two years. Rich, I don't know if you know this again. I'm going to tell Rich. I, I doubt very much that he's watching right now, but after it's after it's all done, when I send him uh, the finished artwork, I'm going, you know, tell him, hey, by the way, you can watch me do your painting. So I imagine, even though he's not watching right now, he he may very well watch later. So Rich, the reason you might not remember me. <laughs> is because I was only at Wycliffe for two years, uh, 11th and 12th grade. I was uh, very, very, very much fringy latecomer kid. And if you weren't in band or if you weren't on track or cross country, then you probably didn't know me because that's those are the places where I hung out and or excelled if you will to the extent that i excelled i excelled in those two areas everything else was just school to me but i, w I certainly enjoyed band and uh, rich i don't remember that seems like you were, were you a football player i know you hung out with a lot of that my memory is you hung up with a lot of football players we might have been in pe together <laughs> And if we were, I was that kid that looked like he was in about eighth grade. <laughs> if you catch my drift, that was me. <laughs> in spite of that, Rich, I grew up fairly well adjusted. <laughs> you can't see me twitching right now. <laughs> to prove how well adjusted I am. All right. <laughs> And as I said, I think Rich hung out with the cool kids. But in my school, it seems to me, anyway, never mind. Hang on. I'll finish that sentence because in a minute, because maybe if I do it all, because I need to do a hair dryer. My deep apologies for the loud noise, but can't be helped. Here we go. A couple of minutes of loud noise. I'll be back when it's done.
whew, hurts me more than it does you <laughs> because I have, I have an earphone, uh, you know, a headphone in my ear. <laughs> so I get to hear that racket twice. Um, here we go. I have a piece of uh, rubber cement or mask picker upper. Just a little, a ball of the dried stuff makes it a little bit easier to pick it up. So right now I'm rubbing off the masking fluid that so it'll leave a white spot wherever I put it down. Uh, masking fluid is a, a, I would say a quite a, quite a traditional, fairly traditional uh, watercolor trick. Not not at all unusual. My use of the watercolor pencils is is unconventional. In as you know, as a, so I ca I can't claim this as a traditional watercolor painting because uh, because of the watercolor pencil and then of course in a little while I'm going to use pen and ink so that it really won't be it'll, it's a perfectly traditional um, you know rendering pen and ink and watercolor is very traditional but it, you just can't call it a straight up watercolor painting so again that's why I call it a watercolor sketch And in this particular painting, I have a strong feeling, uh, we'll see, but I have a strong feeling that I'm going to use some opaque blue, so, which again would make, make it very unconventional if I use opaque blue watercolor down here, because anyway, we'll see. But that, that's my inclination at the moment, that's my guess at the moment as to what I'm going to do later, at, late in this process. I'm also going to use our friend Mr. Clean Magic Eraser here, which is also a, a traditional, that, that is a traditional trick. Lifting out, lifting out color is, is traditional. All right, I think I've got, it, it's very much like rubber cement, the, the stuff that I'm rubbing off. There we go. Now I'm, hang on, you know what? Normally I do pen and ink next, but uh, today it dawns on me, wait a minute, I can save myself a fair amount of trouble, so to speak, quote unquote, if I do, so I'm opening up my jar of clean water over here. Okay, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. show it to you in a second let me get this out of the way it this is a much used one a new one in in its new form this is this is white and thicker <laughs> okay so this is a happily much used already and it removes watercolor paint quite effectively if you keep rubbing, it will go all the way back to white paper. The only thing that will be impacted is that the texture, the surface of the paper won't, will not be like, like virgin water paper, right? It's white paper, but it, it, it's not quite the same as untouched white paper. There's my reference. Oh yeah, right up here. Let's lighten this area right. Now, we'll see in a minute. I might use uh, some masking tape with this. That's a, another trick.
trick that I often employ and by no means unique in that respect. But at the moment, I'm enjoying sort of the soft edged effect that I'm getting here. Just using a brush to get rid of the crumbs. Okay, what else? Ah, sure. Let me tell you where I'm going next after this. Thank you for a few of you for watching today, but none of you have made any chats or comments, and that's perfectly fine. <laughs> You're welcome to hide out in uh, anonymity, but don't be afraid to speak up. I, I love chatting with people. I don't know if you're if you are regulars watching. Okay, so I'm I'm erasing, if you will. So this just a little bit of technique. This feels like a sponge. When I first got one ten years ago or something, I, I didn't understand <clears throat> how it worked because it feels like a sponge. But if you treat it like a sponge, nothing happens to the to the watercolor. The fact that they call it a magic eraser is really quite appropriate because, as you could see, just the way I was handling it just a moment ago, you have to treat it essentially like, like an eraser. That is, you, it, you rub it like an eraser. So what I just lifted up was that corner of that roof. Get it? Now I'm going to do the same thing to uh, this building right here. So if there are any watercolor friends watching, I want you to be saying, well, golly. <laughs> I think that was a quote from Gomer Pyle, showing my age there. Um, this, is a, this is a neat tool. I did, a, I did an online uh, painter's critique two nights ago. My first ever, and I'm looking forward to a lot more. You'll be hearing more about that. And uh, I introduced to them, because we had just one watercolorist uh, on the docket on Wednesday night, but I, I introduced to the group the, the concept of the, uh, this Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. I didn't realize I was introducing. I was speaking as though, you know, you guys all know how to use Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, right? And I got a bunch of blank stares like, no. So I was tickled to be able to tell people about it, so I'm tickled to be able to tell you about it, just in case. Hello, Judy's Art Adventure. Oh my goodness, thank you for jumping on. Thank you. Where are you from? You, don't have, you do not have to answer that question, Judy. <laughs> I'm not creepy. Well, I might be creepy, but I'm not <laughs> my wife likes me. <laughs> um... <laughs> Uh, let's not be too hasty to claim uncreepiness. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's just always fun to know where people are from, and I don't think you've ever spoken before. So, and again, feel free to, <laughs> you do not need to answer that question. <laughs> and I don't know if you are a regular viewer and you just don't usually say anything, but one, I, I, as you can see, I, I don't have <laughs> tens of thousands of viewers. Pennsylvania, very good. I'm in North Carolina, so more or less straight south of you, I presume. I like Pennsylvania a lot. I, I went to high school in Cleveland, Ohio, and one of the places we went for vacation was in uh, North, um, what am I trying to say? Northwest Pennsylvania, yeah. And been, been through in Pennsylvania many times. Uh, Amish country and Pittsburgh and of course Philadelphia I have a sister who lives in far eastern Pennsylvania right now good to have you on board thank you for speaking up I'm just using this chip brush so let me show you a review what I've done with the magic eraser, I lightened this wall, the corner. This was already quite light, this roof, but there was a bit of green coming over there. Then some of that wall, 
and let me see here. Yep, I think I'm going to do this this other wall as well. So again, this here's you can see the photograph. I'm doing this painting for an old high school friend, Rich or Richard. I graduated from high school on the east side of Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, I don't know about you, Rich, but I thought we had a great high school uh, uh, career, you know, great high school season era. My, my impression is, we, we, I don't know how we missed a lot of the problems. <laughs> it didn't seem to me like we had a lot of horrible things going on. <laughs> we had red and yellow, black and white kids, <laughs> and it seemed to me we got along quite, quite well. Anyway, <laughs> Rich obviously is Italian, and I've been telling people for years, Rich, that 75% of my high school was Italian, but is that true? That's an awfully high number. It was certainly the, it was majority Italian, I think. And, I'm not quite as, I'm from extreme northern Italy, <laughs> otherwise known as England, or before that, uh, Sweden. <laughs> but anyway, I had uh, a good experience there. I ran cross country and track, and I played music. We, um, for any, any, if there's any classical music aficionados listening by any chance, um, this was the early 70s when we moved, when my family moved to um, Wycliffe, Ohio. And uh, the Cleveland Symphony was very near the zenith of its power, if you will, under George Zell, and my family was a very classical music kind of family, so we loved it. All right, I'm going to bear with me again. I'm going to uh, blow this with a hairdryer, so it'll be noisy for just a minute. Sorry about that, but this has got to be dry before I start doing any ink. I just changed my mind about something, so hang on here just a second. I just decided this is water down here, and uh, water in any scene. Here's a little painting trick, painting tip, by the way, if you're an artist. Um, anytime you can man manage to, to squeeze some water <laughs> into your painting, um, that's a good thing. Um, people really like to see water in their paintings. It's, it's sort of strange, honestly. Strange, but true. And now I'm going to do something else, sort of unusual. Having lifted out that, that little bit of uh, white, I didn't take it all the way to white, of course. I'm going to go ahead and do some some blue in there to represent water in a little bit. And uh, now I'm going to, whoops, yeah, I'm going to take the tape off and then 
very carefully with wet paper, very, very carefully with wet paper. Well, <laughs> my masking tape did not keep the tape, the water in place, the, the blue paint, and that's fine. Uh, but I'm just going to touch up here real quickly. Now I have another trick up my sleeve that, that is another trick that is conventional or traditional watercolor and it's related to what I'm doing right now which is lifting paint out with uh, just with a, a wet brush and I'll almost certainly be doing some of that also as I proceed with this painting. All right bear with me again loud noise just for a couple minutes so hang on I'll be right back. All right, I think that's dry enough. Let's see. By the way, the, the tape on the back is just a little, a little watercolor trick. When you're working on, as I am today, on 140 pound paper, which is not very thick, right? Um, you put tape on the back and it help, diminishes the, the rolling that happens with this thin, cheap paper. It's always I, more fun to work on 300 pound, of course, but sometimes I don't always do 400. All right, now, I think I'm going to do pen and ink next, but let me think just a second. Bring the photo back down here. I'm quite happy with the color here so far, by the way. And, and a lot of the red that you see in here is watercolor, well, it's all watercolor pencil bleeding um, and blue and a and little bit of yellow. So those are the three colors I used. And you can see the yellow just showing up everywhere. Um, okay, I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and go to uh, pen and ink and I'm putting on Again, one of my magic gloves, <laughs> cheap cotton gloves that you cut off four fingers so that I can rest my hand on this paper and I don't get any, um, any oils from my hand on the paper, which is not a good thing, as you can imagine. All right, the pen that I'm using today is, uh, I bought it from Jerry's Artorama. I don't know if it's exclusive to them or not. The, the brand name is Pen and Ink Sketch. <laughs> I just want to say they, they did not ask me about the marketing. <laughs> it seems to me a singularly lacking in imagination name, but oh, all right. Not my job. Um, <laughs> and it's got um, basically waterproof black India ink. Techno Art Waterproof Drawing Ink. Uh, not ideal for this kind of pen because this, this will dry in the pen and can cause problems. The best way to clean a pen that has this in it is with denatured alcohol. But don't leave any plastic parts soaking in um, denatured alcohol overnight because the, the alcohol <coughs> will eat up the plastic. You can ask me, well, how'd you learn that, Mr. Dan? <laughs> I learned most of the stuff I know in art, I learned 
the hard way, just like many of you. <laughs> How'd you learn all that stuff? Oh boy, you don't even want to know. <laughs> all right, um, let me give you a little bit of my thinking as I begin to to draw. Um, my default setting as an artist, and I, I, and many of you are like me. My default setting is is to paint or to draw too tightly as opposed to loosely, and I don't even like the term loose, but in this conversation that you know what I mean by that. And uh, somewhere around 99.9% .9 of the artists I've met over the years are, are just like me. We are all struggling to get, again, quote unquote, looser, even though uh, if I get into that topic, I'll explain later why I do not at all like I, I have forsworn <laughs> the use of the term loose. Be that as it may, let me move on. I am like most of you. I want to get looser. And uh, a corollary to that or of a very closely related ailment, if you will, weakness next to that is um, I tend to overpaint and overdraw. I draw too much. That is to say, I don't mean I, in life. I mean on a on a painting, I paint too much. I draw too much. I or, in other words, I over, I tend to overdo it. All right, Is anybody anybody out there, like me, do you tend to overdo it? The fact is, I I know, as I like to say, I know who you are, <laughs> even if you're not saying anything, if you're an artist. That is to say. Because I know what most of us artists, I know where in, where in we struggle. And uh, I'm right in there with you. Uh, the same things that, that most of us struggle with. Uh, getting too tight, doing, overdoing it. All right, so while I, so here's one of the, uh, the, the mindset that I have as I am beginning to do this pen and ink stage because of, of, of all the phases or elements here in this painting. See, the, the watercolor is real loose. The, the pencil, watercolor pencil is quite loose. Um, but this pen and ink is tight, 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 right? So one of the things I'm telling myself is ride the brakes. <laughs> Don't overdo it. Don't do anything that you don't have to do. In other words, if you can get away without drawing it, do. And uh, again, along those lines, you see so far I've drawn from here to here to here. I am not going to continue that throughout the entire drawing. I'm going to focus, most of my drawing is going to be in this area right up here. Again, see the that's the the most interesting part of the scene are these buildings, this bridge or looks like it looks like a balustrade on a balcony actually and then there's a a tunnel, a passageway that goes underneath it here. So this is the most interesting part of the scene. Everything else is supporting it. Now the water of course is important, but I don't have to it already looks like it already says water to the viewer, so I don't need to draw that. Anyway, um, so I'm going to try to not let my brain get turned off, <laughs> which I am fully capable of doing. I'm just kind of starting to draw and, and like right here, starting to do some cross hatching. I'll do most of my cross hatching, by the way, with with one of these pens, but I can do a little bit. Um, Because this this part right here is going to be quite quite dark, so I'm uh, 
Um, yeah, this this balustrade. I think that's I think that's what this is called. You know, a stone uh, railing, if you will. Heavily ornate with very European looking to me, you know. We have places like this in America, but the places that are like this in America look remind me of Europe, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's places in America that are acting European. So uh, I, think, I think this is one of the most important uh, visual elements. In, in the scene. So yes, I'm even look at the way I'm holding the pen even. This is the, the classic um, control grip, sometimes known as the death control grip, as opposed to this, which is a, more of a sketching grip. I'll go back and forth between the two. When I want, when I really want a lot of control, I will hold the pen in this manner. Then when I want to be more loose, expressive, sketchy, um, I have another assignment from Mr. Rich, my client here. He has asked that I work the number 99 into the painting somewhere. Now that's all, I've, that's all he told me. I have no idea why, but I'm sure there's some clever reason, some personal code either between Rich and his wife or Rich and their friends and his wife and their friends or maybe this trip was taken in 99 or maybe, I don't know, I don't, maybe, it, you know, there's something. Anyway, so, you know, fun, 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 fun. I don't mind that at all. A little bit of extra fun challenge to, to work into the artwork. Well, hello, Yumesh Patel. <laughs> Hello, indeed. Nobody's, nobody's saying much, are they? <laughs> One of the famous Patels out of India. <laughs> uh, I don't know how long, and maybe you are still in India, or maybe you are in America, and you own a hotel. <laughs> if you don't, a lot of your kin folks do, right? <laughs> I love it. I had a, my first exposure to the Patels was about four or five years ago. I had an art student. We had developed quite a friendship. And uh, yes, he in his retirement, he took up art because he had owned several hotels. <laughs> told, told me, what, 60% of the hotels in America are owned by people from India and 95% of them are named Patel, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> so good to have a hotel owner watching us in our broadcast today. <laughs> forgive me, forgive me, Patel, if I'm making um, it's all in all in with complete respect and affection. I promise you. All right. Um, again, I'm I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to remember. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Be careful! Be careful! Be careful! Do you really? I'm asking myself. Do you really need to draw that part? Do you really need to draw here? And I'm trying to limit limit my drawing to where it actually is needed. Now, of course, I am indeed trying to be faithful to this image. To that extent, I'm actually going to draw these, even try to indicate the, the kind of plant that is right here. So I'm drawing leaves. You may be sure I am not going to draw 
all the leaves, right? Just enough to get the idea across so that the viewer's mind completes the picture. And then besides doing this outline kind of drawing with a fountain pen, I will probably be doing some cross hatching. Well, I've already started some right there. This is going to go very dark right here. Just, you see that there it is right there, almost black. Tunnel. And again, I, I consider that to be a significant uh, visual element in in the scene here. That little bit of darkness. That's where that's the path that the this is and a nice photograph here, Richard. I don't know if you took it, but we're, we're, it's got a, a number of classical elements. Number one, an archway over the top. That great way to frame a painting, and then the Z formation, classic right there. And it actually goes three turns, one turn, two turns, and then third turn going underneath there. So a, a lot of already very nice elements built into this photograph, so I don't have to invent much at all. Hello, Artist Ross. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for saying hi. I'm going to get away from that. Good idea to move around often in any kind of painting. Good idea to move around. Don't just bore down. Hello, Michael. Thank you for joining us. It's not too late over there. Oh, I guess it is kind of late. <laughs> is it 10, 10, 15 where you are? Or is it 9? The sun's still up here at our house. We'll be for a couple hours yet. My favorite um, pen and ink and watercolor art. I've mentioned him many times over the years. Favorite, one of my favorite pen and ink and watercolor artists was a man named Neil Watson, Doctor Neil Watson to be exact. Uh, and I still in spite of my respect, have not managed to uh, match him in his delight, delightfully loose, again, there's that word that I don't like to use, I'm using it twice in the same broadcast, um, <laughs> delightfully expressive, uh, energetic pen and ink and watercolor marks. I knew him personally here in North Carolina 25 and 30 years ago. He was fairly well known. He's passed away way too young a number of years ago. Um, you can, you, I think you can find stuff if you look up Neil Watson. He's one that I considered a, a mentor. I don't obligate myself quite to get all of these architectural details exactly correct back here. I don't think that's necessary. It's, as you can see, it's a little bit of a hodgepodge. I'm gonna, of course, I'm going to get this pretty accurate and this. But, you know, big wall here, roof here, roof here. I'll definitely capture those elements, but uh, not going to try 
you know, not going to get really finicky. Again, because it would just require too much drawing, too much detail, too much fussiness. Um, better, in my opinion, to let, let the viewer finish the scene to a significant degree. Yeah, 1020, that's what I thought, five hours ahead of us. Michael, do you guys have what we call daylight savings time? Twice a year here we change the clocks. I hope that is coming to an end. I think that's one of the more silly inventions <laughs> in America. <laughs> Personally, it doesn't matter. I don't imagine many people have died from it, but it's a nuisance and it's, in my opinion, quite silly. <laughs> And if you don't change your clocks, then that means part of you have to put up with a nuisance of every, twice a year. The Yanks are changing their time in relationship to everybody else on the planet, right? I sort of think that's what happens. I have a brother in Japan, and I think I can never remember if he's 12 or 13 hours ahead of us because part of the year he's 12 hours ahead and part of the year he's 13 hours ahead. So I can never know which part of the year we're in. <laughs> <laughs> if I thought about it really hard, I could think about it, but I, I don't want to think about it hard. All right, these are um, white flowers, white blossoms on a big bush here. So I'm trying to um, indicate with some skinny leaves, so I'll draw a few of them. Again, I don't obligate myself to draw a circle around all of these white blobs, but I did a, uh, a pen and ink watercolor sketch. It's exact same uh, technique, exact same medium last week. And uh, I don't suppose there's much of a risk of that client hearing this broadcast. <laughs> so uh, I'm taking a bit of a chance. Um, I, w I was... Uh, no, oh, let me let me rush to the end and say, by the time it was done, I was satisfied with it, but I was not happy with uh, with the way that illustration proceeded. It was the strangest thing I've done. I've done, you know, scores of paintings in this technique, and uh, you know, I feel feel pretty confident. I know how to do it, <laughs> but for some reason, that particular job. It just didn't. It didn't go the way the way I wanted it to. I had to arm wrestle it a a good bit. That's why by the time I was done, I was happy with it, and, and my client sounded happy, and so on. I didn't even post it on my as I do normally. I didn't even post it on my uh, community page. Um, it, it brings up a very interesting, at least what seems to me interesting phenomenon here's a phenomenon no that's plural phenomenon in in art that I don't know that I've ever heard anybody address and that is that as, as artists especially if we're truly creative people and not not all artists are creative by the way artists have in the general public have the have the reputation of being creative, but that that's a, in my in my opinion, that's a, a misnomer, a misreading. Um, some artists are creative and some are not, um, and and that's not a judgment about their art or their character or anything like that. It's just some some artists are very good at following the rules, even if they're it's their own rules, and and doing the same thing over and over over again. In fact, by doing that, they develop very often a degree of proficiency that somebody like me say may not ever develop because uh, I'm always messing around. <laughs> but I think most of us have a, if we're an artist, most of us have a tendency to mess around. And um, it is, oh, wait, hang on, hang on. See, I'm almost, almost done drawing here. 
with this with this pen anyway. Um, so my experience is that because I'm always almost always experimenting at least a little bit, plus every time I draw, I'm in a slightly different mood, if you will. Like I'm I'm a slightly different person say today than I was yesterday. In fact, I was working on one of my portraits um, downstairs uh, earlier today, and I'll broadcast that whenever it's convenient. But anyway, when I go back downstairs to that portrait, I left it on the east, I left my paints out and so forth. When I go back to it, um, say this evening, I will find myself to be a slightly different artist because I'll be in a slightly different mood than I was earlier today. Does that make sense? It's like every time, and I can imagine some people being way more obsessive compulsive than I am, you know, doing things exactly the same way, but, but I think that's the extreme. Anyway, um, that's a principle I haven't heard spelled out by other artists very much, that every time you approach the easel or the drawing pad, whatever it may be, you're a slightly different person. You, you, different emotions, different mindset, and sometimes it rises up to bite you in the butt. <laughs> like it did for me last week. Um, I don't know where I went off the rails. And again, I, was, I kept working. I, I didn't have any choice, right, when it's a commission. I kept at it until I was happy, but I had to use more opaque medium than I, than I would have preferred. Um, but because of that experience last week, I'm, e I'm a, even a little bit more, I'm a little more spooked, so that's a good word for it, I'm a little more spooked today on this painting. Um, I really want to make sure I don't overdo it. And especially overdo this this part of it, the drawing, the pen and ink drawing. So I think I'm going to do uh, some. Do I even need? Do I need to paint all those railings? No. I mean, draw. I don't think I do. Right. Your eye is already telling you, right, that this is a railing. So I'll stop there. It's easier to add than it is to take away. Yeah, I'm going to paint. I was debating for a second there. I thought I might do some cross hatching with a finer pen, but no. <laughs> Michael, you do the same thing, do you? That's funny. I read an article somewhere in a newspaper this year that Somebody somewhere suggested we might America might stop doing this. I think it was I think it was started when the culture was much more agrarian. Of course, would apply to Scotland as well. I don't know if Scotland is more agrarian than us now. I have the impression that it is, but I might be wrong. All right, let's do some some yellow. I have some roots in the uh, Gun Clan. Did I tell you that, Michael? And the Mackenzies as well. But I also have a lot of roots in Ireland and in York, Yorkshire. Um, and I, I didn't know. I grew up in Michigan, and in my part of Michigan, there's a lot of Dutch. And I lived there much of my life, and then moved south uh, in my, by myself in my early 20s. After my wife and I got married, uh, we moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, those of you who know anything about 
American culture know that there are a lot of Swedes in Minnesota. And um, I was positive, it was a strange, very strange experience. I was positively astonished at how much um, the people in Minnesota looked like me. I'd never lived in a part of the world. I'd lived in Canada, Michigan, Ohio. And then when I moved to Minnesota, I, you know, walking in a public place like at the mall, it's like, oh my goodness, these people all look like they could be my cousins. So evidently, I had no idea until that experience, I had no idea that I looked Scandinavian, but evidently I do. I was blonde. I'm not so blonde anymore, as you know. More bald than anything, but anyway. <laughs> that was an interesting experience, so. Distended, d distended, <laughs> that too. D <laughs> we won't continue that conversation. Descended <laughs> from Vikings. It <laughs> kind of makes you want to treat me with a little more respect, don't you think? <laughs> oh, my. There's a history, huh? You know, the fact is, <laughs> in, in America, we have a very particular local history, local and contemporary, if you call contemporary, the last 100 and 200 years. Um, but the fact is, every race <laughs> has abused and enslaved every other race. That is the way of humanity. And um, so, sure, I got plenty to be ashamed of. My, my, my ancestors thundered ashore in, in uh, Isle of Wight and Lindisfarne and and massacred the peace-loving monks and stole their gold and <laughs> robes and whatever. But the monks were my ancestors too, so there you go, right? <laughs> uh, what I find really fascinating, I just heard this again, I'm history uh, I'm not a historian, but history is one of my hobbies, so I just I just love it. And I listen to a lot of history. Um, when I'm not broadcasting with you guys, if I'm just painting, I'm listening to podcasts typically. Not even music. When I play music, when I'm broadcasting, it's just for you guys. <laughs> it's just so you don't have to just hear my voice. I don't know if you can even hear it. Anyway, um, what I find that, that the Viking kings who massacred the Christian monks in, and I'm, I'm saying Lindisfarne and Isle of Man, Isle of Wight, I'm forgetting, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank all of a sudden. Iona, there, I think that's one of the one I'm looking for. Anyway, um, they went back and some of the early Viking kings, when they died, they wanted their bodies buried back in Iono, Lindisfarne, Isle of Wight. They, they developed, in other words, they became Christians. Anyway, interesting, fascinating, fascinating. Everything's fascinating. <laughs> Some of it horrifying, right? I heard today, speaking of history, one of every 200 males on the entire planet is descended directly from Genghis Khan. I've heard a statistic very much like that before. After every single battle, he commanded, this is kind of, this is yucky, but I'm this far in, he demanded that the most beautiful girls be brought to his tent. And uh, whew, hard to imagine. On that scale, hard to imagine. 
Um, hard to imagine rape and pillage and destruction and evil on that scale. But that is the human state. I, I've said to many people, forgive me while I ramble here, by the way, or don't forgive me, which either one. But if, to, if you to understand human history, um, throughout our entire history, human beings, as soon as their own village got, the, as soon as the males in their village got healed up from their last battle, the males in this village would strap on their leather and swords and whatever the case, helmets, and go thundering over the hill and rape, murder, and pillage and kill every male in, on the, in the village on the other side of the hill. That is all human history. There is no exceptions to that. And uh, any, any time, like in particular, when I hear people say, oh, we live in such terrible times. And I say, yeah, except for all the times that came before this one. <laughs> These are the worst times in human history, except for, of course, all the errors that precede this one. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, boy. And, and I don't want to get into anything political, I really don't, but <laughs> if you're not a history buff, then pay attention to somebody who is, because you might have the wrong impression about history if, you, if you're not a, if you're not, if, if history isn't one of your hobbies, then you probably are, are living under <laughs> the wrong impression of what history's been like. I <laughs> actually live in by far the most peaceful and prosperous era in all of human history, bar none. Whew. Even including the, what, Ma Zedong killed, what, 80 million of his own people, followed by Stalin who killed uh, 40 or 60 million of his own people. Hitler's way down the list. He's, he's a despicable beyond description, of course, but if you just do, just do it by the numbers, he doesn't even make the varsity team. <laughs> Whew. Cheerful, huh? Joy, joy. Yeah, that's why people tune in <laughs> to listen to me. Well, the point is we live in the in a remarkably blessed season. And I I believe it's gonna continue. I really do. You can call me a cuckoo nuts, but uh, don't call me that too quickly. Uh, give me some, give me some evidence, because um, I have some on my side, and you probably. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> That's enough. That's enough of that. All right, let's do <laughs> um, a nice pale orange roof here. Well, you guys are start chatting up a storm now. I got some of you going probably, didn't I? Yeah, Nelson and Mackenzie. Yep, definitely. <laughs> Dan, the terrible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, Michael, and uh, oh my goodness, an hour from Lindisfarne. My wife and I, for a while, we discussed possibly visiting um, Scotland or Ireland for our 40th anniversary, which was last Sunday. <laughs> of course, <laughs> all of all those discussions went flat out the window, didn't they? Um, anyway, if we come and visit, Michael, I'll let you know. We'll drop in for a visit. Wouldn't that be fun? I, oh, I love I love the history. I love the history of Patrick, and I know I just jumped the pond there, Michael, a little bit. But now you guys, you, you, we are all related. The Celtic, Celtic Pictish. Uh, Michael, going back down to England, you know, merry, merry old England. Um, 
most of us Yanks aren't, aren't real, real well versed on English history, but we, we've probably heard the term um, Essex, Sussex, w Wessex, and Northumberland. I think I've got that right. And if one of you is a real history buff, please straighten me out. Okay, Wessex is West Sussex. Essex is East Sussex. Um, Sussex is South Sussex, and Northumberland is North. Those are four tribes. And what did they do through most of their history? And this this is like um, I've, I don't know if you've ever read any of you have ever read the the Venerable Bede or Bede or Bed or Bede. Anyway, around here most often count the Venerable Bede. Seven was it no was it seven forty or six forty? Anyway, A.D. Uh, the first real historian of England, and uh, yeah, for most for most of its history, those dear old gentle. <laughs> Stoic British people. What have they done most of their life? Thundered over the hill and killed everybody in the next village over. That's what we've done most of our life. <laughs> Even those nice English people. <laughs> of course, you, we're we're Yanks, so we have a slightly different take on those nice English people, right? Because we were one of the last that fought with our cousins. King George and President George, General George at the time, locking horns, but all that's under the bridge now, isn't it? We're best of friends, <laughs> happy to say. <laughs> I grew, was born in Canada, so I have a particular soft spot in my heart, spot in my heart for uh, the, the Commonwealth. Sometimes we get some uh, some of our regular viewers are Australian and, and Kiwi, New Zealandish. So again, I have a bit of a soft spot in my heart for. When I was a kid, the the Canadian flag, of course, still had the Union Jack in it, right? Still had the British flag. It wasn't until I was like 12 or 13 years old that we got the Canadian flag that most of us recognize now with the with the maple leaf. Not everybody was happy about that, by the way, <laughs> including my parents weren't weren't all that thrilled with it. Even even aesthetically, weren't all that thrilled with the new Canadian flag. They were. My parents were Anglophiles, lovers of England. Nothing wrong with that. I don't mean nothing wrong with England. There's something wrong with every country. Don't, I've already established that, right? <laughs> we're all screwed. Hey, gang, guess what? We're all we're all screwed up. <laughs> we all are. There are no exceptions, no exceptions at all. But anyway, my parents and I inherited that bit, a lot of that from them. Uh, <laughs> Uncle Keg is gone. <laughs> Way to go, Michael. 35 years. Good for you, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uncle, the Wessex folks fought the, the Danes Vikings in 878. <laughs> the good old days. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, mixing up... Um, are we having fun yet? I appreciate you guys. <laughs> I still wonder why you don't have something better to do, but that's all right. We've we've had that conversation a lot, and I know a lot of you are painting while I drone on <laughs> in the background. And when you get tired of my droning, you just go listen to somebody else. I understand. Believe me, <laughs> I know how, we know how this works. Look, I didn't need to draw all those ink lines over here because I was going to come back and paint those railings in anyway. Who'd have, who'd have thunk it? It looks like I planned ahead, but I didn't. But I did have the wherewithal, can I use that word, to, to not overdraw. And now I'm really glad that I didn't because this, this ends up a lot more subtle. 
Um, I'm going to do just a little bit more watercolor before I pick up um, my fine point pens, which are these waterproof 0 0.2 millimeter, whatever, whatever that means. Um, but I'm going to do a little bit more um, indicating some of the water down here. I was discussing watercolor painting with an old friend the other day and um, uh, for better or worse, um, I've, been, I've been a watercolor painter really most of my life, sort of a, a watercolor major if you will, if there was such a thing when I was in college. Um, and and I, I'm very much in the habit of painting with a flat brush. I don't use a round brush very much at all. I'm not even recommending that. I think it is. I did see a, a really good famous watercolor painter not too long ago, however, who I was encouraged <laughs> to see that he or she, I don't remember who it was, um, did the same kind of thing. Um, painted a lot with a, with a flat brush. I just just had another idea. I don't want to um, get too much detail busyness up here in this in this path, but I do want it to look like laid brick. So it just dawned on me, wait, 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 I could accomplish that better with a brush than, than with a pen. So let's do that. Oh, another habit, I was, what I started out to say actually was that uh, another habit, for better or worse, that I have is um, I paint with a brush in one hand and a tissue in the other. I do a lot of blotting up and and again I'm not even claiming that that's a good habit. It just is what it is. <laughs> and since I'm 66 years old, <laughs> I don't usually think of myself as old, but <laughs> when I ask myself, is that habit, is, am I likely to leave that habit? in the years that I have left. And I think, yeah, probably not. <laughs> First of all, I'm not convinced that it's a bad habit, but, you know, too much of a good thing, too much of anything is come maybe is a bad habit, but. Um, I used this brush very briefly a little while ago, and let me point it, point it out again. This is a bristle brush, oil painting brush, not a watercolor brush, so it's stiff, right? Um, and it's a part of my, I have one in every watercolor kit. I have several watercolor kits, you know, a bit travel and so on and so forth. And uh, anyway, I have, I keep a, a bristle brush uh, nearby all the time. Now, why did we just stop broadcasting? Look. I think we're okay. Anyway, for the purpose of lifting out color. <laughs> Indeed, you are correct, of course. Uncle, I don't have any beefs with the 
to the Canadian Maple Leafs, either the flag or the hockey team. <laughs> I do find it, I find history fascinating, but if you'll, if you'll bear a little venture into things, what, metaphysical for a moment, people often wonder why there's so much gun violence in America. And I do not, I'm not going to pretend to have the answer, but I do find it, being a, being a Canuck myself, originally, I do find it interesting. There's, I mean, a fraction of gun violence in, in Canada that there is in the United States. Well, the United States was birthed in revolution, right? It came into being with guns blazing. Now, and some people, of course, many over the years have said, yeah, we shouldn't have done that. Well, no, things were pretty bad under, under Uncle George. It was, it, was a pretty, it was a pretty oppressive system. So anyway, I'm not going to second guess our forefathers. Um, and I like the United States of America. But it is true that, that we were birthed slinging guns and uh, and Canada was not you know could if if the United States if it had hung on you know under the Union Jack as a part of the Commonwealth for another 150 years like Canada did could things have turned out differently who knows you know you know but but fascinating to think about not not to have not to fight about just fascinating to wonder I've got another roof up here that I need to do some some uh, lightening of, some lifting out. So back to back to the masking tape and the uh, magic eraser. There. Oh, and I've got to paint some blue sky, don't I? Typical photograph. Here, let me show it to you again. The sky is blown out. Right. Typical. Typical. Uh, but just because it's that way in the picture doesn't mean that we have to imitate that or copy that in in our painting. And I certainly want. All right. So those of you who maybe missed the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser magic a while ago, you're about to see it again. Forgive me while I try to get this reference photo. All right. So I want this this area right in here, and this is fairly damp and you treat it very much like an eraser you have to rub it and it, it actually beads up like an eraser dissolves if you will with the use there that's probably good enough let's blot that dry whoops and I am going to have to plug in my phone let's see if we get static <laughs> yeah, Michael Braveheart was pretty pretty popular around here for a lot of us, my family. I don't know if you've heard my story of my my daughter, who's now thirty seven, taking a couple spending a couple summers in Scotland when she was I think eighteen and nineteen years old. Quite the story. She was. She was. She went there all by. I mean, she didn't go with some any organization. She went there. She went there because she felt like God wanted her to, and it was quite the quite the experience. On a number of levels. All right. So there's my blue sky. A little bit too blue. A little bit too dark. There. Oh yeah, and then this this roof also needs to be uh, 
orange. I've, I think I've unified the color of the roofs in this, in this scene just a little bit, and I'm completely uh, fine with that. I, I, I think that was a good choice. In fact, I'm going to even add this orangish shade a little bit more to this face of this building here. I said a while ago that I was going to quit painting and do water, do pen and ink again, and then I kept going and going and going. But now I am finally, finally going to stop watercoloring for a bit. I'll no doubt come back and do more. Probably do more. I shouldn't say no doubt. Probably come back and do more in a bit. But time to switch now. And again, I'm reminding myself to. Put on the brakes, don't do too much. Um, okay, just a word about the, the the pen and ink look, the pen and ink technique. Um, I can I can accomplish all the realism I want, so to speak, quote unquote realism I want all the shading, all the gradation of values, all the lightnesses and darknesses with, uh, with watercolor. I don't need to use um, pen and ink, like I'm doing some hatching right now. I don't need to use this technique to achieve a darkening effect here, right? So why then am I using it? And the answer is classic prints of the classic art. Um, I'm drawing these little lines because these little lines are fun to look at. <laughs> Fair enough. That's all. Just purely, they add, they add a texture. That's the word. They add a texture to the drawing. Doesn't need to be there. I'm just doing it because it looks nice. Eye candy, if you will. And I'll do, uh, most of what I'll do will be right here in the focal, a tiny bit elsewhere. And I don't know how many of you have seen my uh, pen and ink cross hatching video, um, but my most typical cross hatching technique is what you see here. I make the first layer all goes the same direction, so I've already established, and, and that's just purely my tradition. It's not the only way. It's not the best way. It's just a crazy Dan Nelson way. In fact, it, it's certainly not the most traditional approach. The most traditional is a curvilinear cross hatching, you know, where the, the, the shading follows the roundness of, let's say, if the figure, the person's face or the person's body, or in this case, the bush. Um, that would be a much more traditional or typical cross-hatching technique, but for some reason, over the decades, this is what came out of me, and I'm rather partial to it, and it, it certainly makes it look like a Dan Nelson uh, piece of art because of the cross-hatching going in this direction. I got a request a little while ago for someone wants me to do a pure uh, pen and ink drawing. I'm, I'm anxious to do. Um, at the moment, I need to make money, so I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing the job. Imagine that. So I'm doing the jobs that not, will pay the bills. It would be fun to have a, a pen.
kind of neat cross hatching job that, that I could do and get paid for. Here's the this area I'm going under this tunnel or underpass, whatever you want to call it, that I take to be a real key uh, dark bit of the of the composition. Cross hatching typically includes a lot of dots as well, drawn drawn dots, dots that are drawn in like that. You see it in the looking and thinking just a minute. Slightly different style of cross hatching I'm doing right now. Sometimes I call it scribble hatching, where my pen actually is drawing in both directions, the upstroke and the downstroke both. It's a little bit messier, and again, just use it for effect. That's all. Whereas, as you probably know, with my traditional cross hatching like this, it's only the downstroke that is making the mark. I pick pick the pen up to go uphill, so to speak. Again, this little bit of texture is just for fun, just for visual fun. That's all. I don't, you know, I'm not. I don't need to do it to to do shading, as I would if it were if it were a purely uh, pen and ink um, rendering. Then this is how I would achieve shading. But of course, this is not that. Um, I can get all the values I need just from the watercolor. So the purpose of this this ink is purely abstract. It's just because I like the texture and I think the texture is fun to look at, so to speak. And I'm going to keep it, most of it, right up here in the center of the, of the uh, illustration. trying to decide whether I want to do any texture on that roof. I want to do just a couple lines. Good enough. And a few, few more dots. Yeah, good enough. Yeah, Uncle, uh, you're ahead of me on the news. I asked when I went to bed last night. I didn't. Sometimes I hear news, and often I don't. I asked my wife, so or I asked somebody, so what's going on in Michigan? Oh yeah, some cuckoo nuts with rifles. I mean, that 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 that's a little alarming, is it not? Not that I don't think they've got a complaint. I really do, but. Um, you're going to get in trouble if you're mad and having a protest and carrying guns. That kind of changes things a little bit. <laughs> Is that typical of Michiganders? I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. I do know that when I was a kid growing up, the dictionary definition as Michiganders where I grew up, we all we thought this was funny. The dictionary definition of a hillbilly was a Michigan farmer. I rather doubt that that's still the definition, but it was when I lived there, and we thought that was hilarious because you know we thought it was hillbillies as being very different from that. But I just found a bit of um, stuff that didn't get lifted up. Resist, you know. Um, That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> this stuff. Masking fluid. <laughs> there we go. And don't certainly don't like those white dots there, so let's fix that. Um, I'm going to stop. I'm tired of cross-hatching for a bit. Um, now, the next question is, do I want to use... Um, Do I want to use um, opaque light stuff? I'll tell you what, before I do, let's, so I've got this bristle brush in my hand again. I just rinsed it, as you could hear, in clean water. Let's do some lifting, because I do feel like I, it's pretty close. It, it's pretty good, but it's overall a little bit dark, don't you think? That is to say, it'd be it'd be a little more of an enchanting uh, image with a little more lightness in it. So, of course, I have several tools at my disposal. One is what you see me doing right now, which is lifting out, just just wet it and scrub it a little bit. That's why I like the stiff bristles because you can actually scrub the paper a little bit with the with the stiff bristles. So that's one tool. The next is considerably more powerful, which is um, the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. But of course, it would be hard to do details with that. It would be quite a bit of sophisticated masking. And then the third tool that I can employ, and I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to or not, would be uh, opaque, either opaque white or opaque colors. Now, here's a trick, and for those of you who perhaps have missed the one of my earlier uh, watercolor sketch demos, um, I have ways. I'll glad to pass a few tricks on to you because as you know if you start using gouache opaque watercolor it changes the the cast the feeling of the um the rendering quite a bit because the the opaque the gouache it's called the opaque watercolor just just feels very different from watercolor right um so i have a couple tricks if i do use opaque watercolor slash gouache. Um, I have a couple tricks up my sleeve for disguising the fact or diminishing the the shock, if you will, <laughs> of seeing uh, opaque paint on top of a watercolor painting. And the the two tricks are real very, very simple. That is after you so after you put down the gouache, and you can go back and watch me do this in previous renderings if I don't do it today. After you put down the the opaque watercolor, you come back, you follow up by, after it dries, by doing another real watercolor wash, transparent watercolor wash, on top of the opaque. Now you can only do it one stroke and that's all. You can't, you can't go, you can't do it twice or it'll just blossom up and it'll be a mess. So that's one trick. The other is, um, I'm going to try to lighten the sky up here, make the sky go to a lighter blue. And the other trick is because I'm using um, the ink is, again, after the gouache dries, do some lines, some cross hatching or outlining or whatever on top of the opaque watercolor, also known as gouache. So those two tricks uh, go a long way to disguise and it's not because I'm trying to trick people so much as it, it is, is that it just, I like the feel of watercolor colors. I like the way they look. And, and when you use an opaque watercolor, it, of course, it violates that look quite a bit. So I've just given you a trick, if you will, for um, hiding that that element. All right, I'm going to do as 
it is dawns on me even though in the photograph it's like uh, I guess it does get lighter. It dawns on me that this this little bit of the archway, you see, this is the inside of the arch, that it would look more funner. <laughs> it would look more interesting if it were lighter than this. So I'm going to put recycling some of the masking tape here. Plus it lets me be a little bit crooked, which I like. And I'm going to uh, do a little bit more with the magic eraser. Not too much. I don't want it to get white or too light, but just a little bit lighter. And not all the way down, not all the way down to the corner. Just part way down. All right, let's let's see how that looks. Be very careful when you pick this up. It can tear wet paper really easily. There. Yeah, 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 yeah. That little bit of light. That's nice. That's nice. All right, let's go back to, so, so far, really, I haven't used any opaque uh, watercolor, so in a sense, everything I'm doing is legal. Hey, here's, here's another one. Now, I don't know if this will work or not, but um, using an eraser is, is, a tr is traditional watercolor. It's not breaking the rules. In other words, you can get into oil, you can get into a uh, Watercolor Society of America using this trick. It took a little bit off down here. It's not having much impact on these this darker stuff. Let's and since I'm showing you tricks, hey, what the heck, let's do one more. Michael, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness, yeah, reenact. We have a lot of reenactors here in America, mostly Civil War, our Civil War, that is to say. Um, all right, I was going to say, okay, I I really don't need to do this, but just for those of you who say, okay, what other tricks? Another one is a scratching with a knife. I have here a number eleven blade, very sharp exacto knife of course with each of these techniques you get a slightly different look and yet i want to be careful because i don't want to in a sense open a can of worms and introduce a whole bunch of texture that you know it turns into a hodgepodge so i'm just right now i'm just doing this mostly to demonstrate i'm going to keep it quite limited Um, oh, and just since we're at it, one more thing. Here's a, a cheap stainless steel spoon. You can re-burnish the paper and then apply watercolor to even to the area that I just scratched. So that's this is here as a burnisher. All right. <laughs> have we done enough tricks? Yeah, have we done enough tricks for you? I think we have. But <laughs> one trick deserves another. Just on money on me that making this top railing over here lighter might be kind might be kind of cool once again I, I talked about this yesterday or the day before the process of doing artwork is almost always a process of taking guesses as artists we think we're saying to ourselves huh wonder what it would look like if I did this or that, thus and so. What would it look like if I did, so at the moment I'm saying, hmm, what would it look like if I did some scratching along this top rail with a knife and just made it lighter? Would that look cool? And then after we do, we go, and eh, that didn't work so good, or, oh yeah, that worked great. Which also explains how, be, how every once in a while when I'm going along painting and, and I'm broadcasting and I'll say something like, wow, that looks great. And a, and a non-artist might think, <laughs> that someone doing that is being rather arrogant. <laughs> I am so good. I am so good. That looks great. And I always feel compelled to explain. No, 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 really. That is not. 
arrogance most of the time. That's pure, so innocent, if you will, childlike. True art, it's a, the true artist is speaking up. The true child artist is saying, wow, that looks great. Look at that, it's amazing, that looks good. All right, I'm not very happy with the way this balustrade is sticking out too much. There we go, that's better, that's better. Pushing it back just a little bit. And likewise, the little potted, the little pot things that are sitting on the top of the of the ballast of the yeah the balustrade posts. They're, right now they're light, and that's just because they're left over and never got painted, and I don't think they look good light. So I'm going to darken them. I thought they might look good light, but they don't. So <laughs> at least in my opinion. So there, that's better, I think. Um, I lightened this tree up here uh, by rub by lifting out. Um, but I'm not crazy about the texture and the color that's left. So again, another trick is after doing lifting, like you saw me do, you can often do more watercolor on top. Same thing here. I'm going to do, let's do a very, um, very bright green. I don't mind drawing a little bit of more attention to that area right there. Yeah, with more intense color. Yeah. So now I'm just having fun. It's like, wait, that looked really good. Let's do more of that. <laughs> just paint a few leaves down here, not many. All right, the moment of truth. Um, well, while I'm thinking about that, I'm going to do a little bit of liney texture up here in this rock. Um, the, the question. A big question. Oh, you know what? Hang on. <laughs> I just interrupt myself because I'm an artist. That's what. He, that's the way my brain is working. Oh, wait a minute. Um, I want to darken all this down here, including that light stuff right there. That does not. That's getting way too much attention. Um, this little trick of um, she's not. That's a barely in the photograph. Yeah, this is slightly darker, but I'm exaggerating it quite a bit, as you can see. That little trick of darkening the the ground at your feet, so to speak, is has a name. It's actually called a threshold. At least I've heard some other artists call it that. It seems like an appropriate term. And it's a very conventional, very useful artistic trick. If you're not aware of it, you should be. Not every painting should be thresholded, if I can use a crazy term. Not every painting should be should have a threshold. But many, many times, any kind of landscape uh, will, in fact, look better if the, the closest foreground is dark instead of light. And by the way, I'm also, let's, while I'm doing stuff, big stuff, let's darken this corner up here. That can be much darker, more fun. It's, as you can see, it's kind of purplish, and I like that, but I want it darker. Yeah, all that, I don't know if you, how well you guys can see the whole painting. You can see it better that way, but then it's sideways. Um, that right there just made a significant difference and improvement on the, uh, to the painting, to the composition. So that's called a threshold and often a very, very useful trick. It, it ushers the, it makes the, the viewer step across the darkness into the light. So our eye goes up into the painting. Um, and anytime, again, in a landscape where you have a, a foreground. Oh, and yeah, this over here doesn't need to be this pronounced. Those, those stems, I like them, but they don't need to be that 
they don't need to be that strong, right? Right. Mixing purple and and green together is one of my favorite darkening agents in, in watercolor in particular. Dioxazine, dioxazine violet and and any green, green and purple mixed together. Makes a lovely uh, gray, different shades, all different shades of gray. You know, more green is one, one color, more purple is another. It's similar, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's another favorite of mine, of course, is, and I use this all the time in my oil painting, is uh, oxide red and ultramarine blue. So brown, oxide red is, is, a, is a brown, of course. So brown and blue mixed together also make a very uh, pleasant gray or darkening agent. Um, in oil painting, I don't use the, uh, the green and purple as much as I should, I think. But uh, I use it quite a bit in watercolor for some reason. Just, just habits. All right, that just got better, too. I just uh, painted over those white flowers there. I don't think I need to use any opaque medium, really. I mean, there's places here and there that I could, um, but I don't, I don't think it's a need, so I'll probably just let it go. Speaking of purple and green, I'm going to do it again right now. Oh, and I'm going to add some brown to that. All right, so I've got a very dark mixture right there so that I can, let's just hit the darkest areas in this painting. See, now I'm a little bit nervous because that's there's nothing else in this painting that dark. Let's, let's gingerly put in a little bit of darkness here and there. A little bit of darkness, which makes, I sound like Bob Ross right then, didn't I? Little bit of darkness, which makes the <laughs> happy little darkness which makes the, uh, the light more pronounced, of course. People almost never look at a painting and say, oh, look at the dark. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> surprise, surprise. They look at a painting and say, oh, look at the light, but they, they are not impressed by the light if there's not quite a bit of dark in the painting. Do you understand? Usually, 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 unless you're doing one of those you know, greeting card, like misty, foggy, you know, sunlit window, you know, kind of things, which normally, that, those, that has its place, but that's not, not what we're normally doing, is it? All right, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the little bit of darkness that I'm adding here. So I thought I was just about done, but I wasn't. <laughs> Welcome. So now we're in the danger zone, right? That the shoulda quit while you were ahead danger zone, right? Yes, yes, yes. Right, right, right. Let's be careful. The painting's working. Oh my goodness. Be careful, be careful, be careful. If it's working, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I'm, I'm advancing very cautiously here. But I do like what I've done, adding, adding just more intense shadows, mostly in the, in the foliage. Do you pronounce the I in foliage? Or is it foliage? <laughs> I think it's foliage, right? Uh, but it's one of those words everybody mispronounces if it is foliage <laughs> anyway never mind <laughs> where's our english major or our botanical bo 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 yeah botany ma botanical major where's our botany major when we need a me eh? foliage oh that's nice <laughs> now hang on hang on hang on <laughs> oh boy There's no shadow of this railing. It makes me a little nervous. 
strange the things that make an artist nervous. <laughs> I'm not sure I can sleep tonight. <laughs> You know, I'm not sure about that one spot of light right there. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not, it's not great. I'm just, just pure gray. Just push it right back, that's all. That's better. I'm sitting back literally with my fingers on my chin, my hand, my chin in my hand. Mm -mm -mm. This might be a good time to hit the pause button, walk away from it and come back and decide later. Ah, I hate deciding. I want to finish it now. <laughs> but I, I think probably wisdom would say, walk away from it. You know what else? Here, let's do one more thing and then we'll wrap up. Hello, Zoran, good to have you here. Well, thank you, Narbin. You're very kind, I appreciate it. So I wanna tell you that I really love your videos and your work. Thank you very much, it's very kind. Oh, way to go. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. I inspired you to get better at art. That's very encouraging. I appreciate that. All right. Um, here's something I can do because I can decide I can decide later that what I'm debating here is whether to uh, incorporate some opaque uh, mediums. Um, it can be as simple as using a, a whiteout pen like this believe it or not believe it or not um, or it can be just using uh, white white gouache so I have a tube of white gouache here somewhere here it is right so I can just use white gouache or I can get up my whole gouache tray and start doing color um, those are three different levels um, and, and I really am not worried um, about the watercolor police catching me if I use opaque medium. So I'm, I'm not worried about that. I'm not trying to enter a watercolor competition or anything like that. If I were, I, I would definitely avoid using opaque medium. But I'm not entering a watercolor competition. So I can do whatever I feel like doing problem is I don't really know what I feel like doing and and if I can uh, get by without using any opaque medium you know I I have a slight preference in that direction but it's, it's pretty slight it's not not real strong more way more important that I produce a beautiful painting all right so there you're seeing the whole thing are you let me move you just a little bit Hmm. It's nice. I like it. The colors are very nice. I wish you guys could see it. It always they always look better in person. Well, where would I do opaque? What well, I, I can tell you. First of all, any any green I could come in with some opaque pale green and just hit a few tiny dots on the light side of some of these bushes and and almost get away with that but most people would not even realize that they were looking at opaque uh, likewise uh, some of the white flowers in this bush let me show this photograph again so there's the photograph right so I'm being pretty pretty literal in this my, mine is much warmer, of course. I like it a lot better. I like the deep values here. 
like the warmth. Um, I tell you where one place that I'm in, in what I would be inclined to do it the most would be to mix up a very pale brown, this color right here, and come in here and just do some real discreet spaces between those railings. That would be, that would really be sweet. And I just might let it go at that. Another place that I would like to use it would be to put some sparkle in this water. Again, between these red railings, you can tell that the railings are red, I presume, right? Even though it fades out down here. But put some sparkle. Again, here's the water, and there really is sparkle in the water. And people like water. Um, so those two things, those three things, I guess. Green, white flowers, railing, and sparkle in the water I could I could pick sparkle uh, with a knife and that would be legal so to speak you know what I mean by that that would not be violating uh, traditional watercolor code I'm sitting and thinking I wouldn't mind also doing some lightening up this sky just a little bit hey, while I'm thinking I see a little bit in these windows right here that I'd like to lighten now, um, by the way you not all watercolor colors can be lifted out in this manner. Some are what is called staining. They're more of a dye, more of a stain than a than a suspension. The, the, in other words, the the pigment is not merely, you know, ground up dirt suspended in uh, watercolor medium. Um, and so, so the not all <coughs> not all watercolor colors can be lifted out. By the way, that's for what it's worth. That's why I have a separate uh, watercolor portrait tray because that my watercolor portrait tray. I'm using a knife now. My watercolor portrait tray um, is all liftable colors, so that I want to make sure that if I'm doing a portrait and I get something too dark, then I'm able to lift it out without any trouble. So that's just. You know, you can find out by online all over the place. Just Google, you know, is, is this or that color a staining colors, most traditional name for that, I think. All right, I'm having done, having done a little bit of scratching, I'm going to wet this area right here just a little bit and let's just do a little bit and see how it looks. So I made it wet so that my scratching won't be quite as precise or quite as scratchy perhaps. If I could accomplish the same effect without using opaque medium as I said, I have a slight preference. Maybe it's more than slight. Some of you are saying slight. <laughs> Sounds like you're doing everything you can to avoid it. Okay, well. It's not really, it's not a deep aversion, though. Um, I have on my, on my website, dannelsonart.com. Go to paintings, click on watercolors, and most of the samples you see there are, are this, watercolor sketch technique. And most of those... In fact, many of them, many some of my favorites, is I've just used a whiteout pen. By the way, if you if you do want to use a whiteout pen, um, that's the best brand. Let me show it to you again. Presto, that kind. Uh, better than, say, this is a short one, but this is it's just more awkward to hold. This is the best grip, if you will. Can you see what I'm doing? 
not very well. well. Let's zoom in just for a minute and hope that I remember to zoom back out when I'm done. So the paper is damp, so it's kind of you know, clumping up on the end of my knife. And I'm not getting a real clean, which is what I wanted. I didn't want a real clean. Yeah, that's okay. Um, when that dries, I will burnish. I'll burn. In fact, forgive me. Give me just a minute. I'm going to hit that with a hair dryer because I'm impatient. Okay, bear with me just a minute. All right, I'm showing, I'm showing you more tricks than I anticipated. One trick deserves another, so I'm pulling up out of my, look at a piece of a sandpaper, and I just want to pull, pull off a tiny little piece, and this is 320 grit. So pretty, pretty subtle. sure my paper is quite dry enough that that's a mistake all right but that's all I'm going to do before I do this okay so now I'm burnishing pushing down the fibers with a stainless steel spoon Let's see how that feels all right and now I think I think I think I think I think I can do some ink lines with impunity <laughs> I can get away with it, I think. Yes, indeed. Good, the incline is not bleeding. Whoops, whoops, let me, there we go. All right, the incline is not, right? If you just did this pen uh, either on wet paper or on scuffy, roughed up paper, and it, it would not, it would bleed. But it's not bleeding, because mostly because of the burnishing with the spoon. So there, I've accomplished a little bit of what I wanted right there. I, mean, I think I'm going to let it go with that accomplished a little bit of what I wanted with um, that scratching technique. There's one leaf right here that just, in my opinion, begs to be scratched, to be lightened. Can you hear it? I'm sure you can. All right. And I can burnish that right away. Don't 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 go crazy. Oh boy, that that I've made that mistake. How do you learn that mis <laughs> How do you how do you learn not to go crazy? Right, Every, everything I've learned, uh, every I've, I've made thousands of mistakes, hundreds of thousands. All right, and then I believe I can paint that leaf green. Yes, nice, sweet. Is that sweet, Lake? Yeah. Lake's at my elbow. She just came in the room. Oh, this little light doesn't work very well. Let's fix that. There we go. And I have a little seam here in, in the green, and I have a feeling it would feel better if I reinforced it with a, with a black line. This is part of the reason why, I, for instance, why I go back and forth between watercolor and pen and ink, pen and ink, go back and forth and back and forth. Same kind of thing here. There's a, a seam there that would just look a little more fun if I echo it, if you will. Is that a good word? If I echo it with a with a bit of uh, a line, yeah. You're, you're getting to see this whole process all the way down to the bitter end, really. I thought I'd fade out before now, but I'm having too much fun, and I'm so close to being done now, I might as well just keep rolling. Uh, 
at, at the moment I'm not doing any sparkle down there. It's still a possibility. There's a little bit of dark red right here that I getting too much attention. Let's see if we can scratch that off. Whoops, sorry, off the picture again. There we go. Something happened to my music. Maybe I played through that whole list. That would be unusual. Um, well, I can sign it, can't I? My name is Dan. Whoops. My name is Dan Nelson. Oh, it doesn't have the number 99 in it. Oh, whew, almost forgot. My goodness. Some of you missed that. Oh, I see a perfect place for it right here. I don't know if this is big enough. I, I You know what? I'll, I know what I'm going to do. I'll put, actually, I'll put several, several 99s in it. I wonder if it has something to do with the old TV show Get Smart. <laughs> age in 99. Actually, <laughs> my age is showing again, isn't it? are pretty subtle. There's a 99. So I have several. I'll, I'll make it a I'll make it a game for them. They'll have to find how many 99s can they find. <laughs> What do you think, Lake? It's do you like it? Beautiful. You see anything that needs fixing? Hmm. I think you did a little bit too much blue on those bars. Yeah. And why did you make the bars red? Ah, oh, here's the photograph. Because the bars are red. I just didn't want to paint them all the way down here, so let them kind of fade out. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. You're not sure you agree with that? Well, that decision. Well, you can make it like look a little bit faded, but not blue. Yeah. Oh, but not blue. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think. It would look too much like water. Yeah. Well, there's water behind the bars yeah. down here. Yeah. And I was debating doing some sparkle down there in the water, mm -hmm. which would look nice, but and yeah, I think no one can ever find those ninety nines. Nobody will ever find those ninety nines. Yeah. So I better make them a little more obvious, eh? Yeah. Hmm. I think you're probably right. It 
one of my art advisors there. Um, what are my people saying over here? Hello, Nusaiba. I don't know if I Nusaiba, Nusaiba. I'm going to guess. Excellent, excellent. Thanks for speaking up. Hello, Matt's Art Stuff. Uh, will the white out turn yellow? I, that's a good question. Somebody should Google that. I don't think so. I think it's, for some reason, I think it's pretty archival. Um, After all this, I'm getting the thing, trying to get the thing working here. It dries in the tip, you know, so you have to squeeze it. There we go. Whew! I am going to do just a few of these. See if they do they die do they dry shiny? Uh, barely, but no. Um, all right, the die is cast. I'm gonna do a little bit of sparkle down here, Lake. After all, and I often follow follow this desecration of the traditional medium by citing um, Elvaro Castanet, uh, my favorite watercolor painter in the whole world, and he uses white. And now I'm doing a little bit of that trick, just pushing the, the what's the word, the fakery. <laughs> the, they stand out quite a bit, but if I do a little bit of ink on them or around them, um, they get, they get, the, the illusion is retained to a great, great extent. Fewer people will detect those. And I think that's all I'm going to do is just keep it really, really, really subtle. So there's that. And then I did about four dots up there. And I think restraint might be the, the, wish, the wise thing to do. Of course, I can still um, change my mind, come back and <coughs> do it. There's a little bit, bit of red on this brick right here. Some of the original uh, watercolor pencil, and that just had one piece just a little bit too much. So, I saw an opportunity. I'm going to go for some sparkle up here. Legal sparkle. Legal because it's scratching instead of opaque white. Ooh, that's nice. That's nice. Glad I thought about. Glad I saw that. 
That's nice. Wow. Once again, <laughs> when an artist says that, that's not boastful or braggadocious or arrogant. <laughs> I took a guess. I said, hmm, I wonder if it would look nice if I scratched. That's even better than what I did here. That is lovely. Oh, and that just really draws our eye right up there, doesn't it? So there's my focal point. Just got more defined, and I like it quite a bit. I'm going to do maybe one more thing. I keep saying that, I know. I'm doing some cross-hatching on top of the dark, dark, dark green watercolor that I did up there a while, a while ago. And we'd call that done, gang. Yahoo. Rich? I went to high school with this man. There you go. Hope you get to watch this video. If so, it's been a pleasure doing it for you. All the best to you. Oh, I guess if you watch it, then you'll find out where all the 99s are, right? There's about six, if I recall, six or seven 99s in there somewhere. And I won't review. You're going to have to find them yourself. But they're all, they're all in there. There's one. There's one. Um, there's one. <laughs> there's <laughs> I told you I wasn't going to do it, then I, then I do anyway, huh? All right, thanks gang for watching. I've actually got another watercolor sketch to do, but since I just spent all afternoon showing you that one, I think I'll do this one by myself if it's all right. I'll listen to some history or some philosophy or something while I do this one, a little bit more traditional or ordinary subject matter, but that'll be fun. All right, thanks for watching. Let me see. The Saiba. Do you have an Instagram? Yes, I do. Uh, Dan Nelson Art. Instagram at Dan Nelson Art. And I, I do try to post everything. Eventually, it, it all gets to Instagram. And uh, my website is dannelsonart.com. I'm also on Fine Art America. And I, and I, well, hang on. Let me, some of you guys, you're new. All you've seen is my hand, so. <laughs> and you're wondering, who's this guy that's talking to us? That's me. That'd be me. <laughs> And my granddaughter, Lake. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I try to be easy to be found. I, I post, I'll post this um, on my YouTube channel, on the community page. Are you familiar with the community page? That's if you go to Dan Nelson Art, my, or whatever it is, YouTube, Dan Nelson Art, um, there's a place where YouTube allows us to publish photographs and still images and so forth. And I, I definitely will publish. I will put this there. All right. Thanks, guys. I'm going to say goodbye. And uh, thanks for watching. Bye-bye. That's exactly right, Matt. I did use that with my cartoons. Okay. Bye-bye.